Are you struggling with understanding ABGs? Are you trying to figure them out but just can't? Well, if you're in RT school, nursing school, or just want to get to know ABGs, stick around to find out more about them. Hey guys, my name is Daniel from Dolier Media, and today I'm going to be talking about ABGs. I'm going to be showing you guys exactly how to understand them and everything you need to know about them that's relevant to your profession or to the medical field. Now, ABGs are something that a lot of students struggle with and even people that have been working for over 10 years still struggle with ABGs. ABGs are arterial blood gases. I'm not gonna be talking about the process of drawing an ABG, but I'm gonna be talking about understanding the results of an ABG and exactly what you need to do to fix the problem that you see in front of you. ABGs are usually drawn from radial arteries and we consider ABGs good blood. And what that means is that it's full of oxygen, it doesn't have that much waste, and it's gonna tell you a lot about how the person's breathing and how their metabolism is working. One of the first things you need to know about ABGs is that it's very critical to run them very quickly. Now, within 15 minutes, what happens is that the stuff in the actual blood starts metabolizing the oxygen and it starts having a byproduct of CO2. We're gonna get into what those things mean, but just so you'll know, the longer it takes to run the ABG, the more inaccurate your results will be. The first number you see in an ABG is gonna be your pH. Now what your pH tells you is the acidity level of your blood. Now we want that range to be between 7.35 and 7.45. Now what does pH mean? So pH is a way that we can measure hydrogen ions or the acidity or baseness of a certain thing. The scale itself is between one to 14, with seven being neutral. Anything lower than seven is gonna be more acidic and the lower it gets, the more acidic it is. So something that's a pH of one is gonna be way more acidic than something that's a pH of five. Now on the opposite end, anything higher than a seven is gonna be more base or more alkaline, which we see in salts. So something that's 14 is gonna be way more alkaline than something that's eight. And that's gonna be pretty acidic, as opposed to Clorox or bleach, which are gonna be in the higher end, which are 11 to 12. Stomach acid happens to be around one to two, so we see that soda is very close in nature to stomach acid and on the acidity level. So blood likes to be around 7.35 to 7.45, like I said. It's a very small margin that's just a little bit more salty than it is acidic. The reason pH is very critical is that if it gets any more acidic, proteins begin to unwind and denature. Now what that means is they actually lose their shape, which means they lose their function. We actually see this in meat when we marinate certain steaks. If we marinate them in anything that's acidic, they start breaking down and getting a little bit more tender. That's actually the protein unwinding. Now, if you have your blood in your actual system that gets a little bit more acidic, you're going to start unwinding the proteins and you might die because of that. On the other end of it, if we get any more alkaline, we actually get something that in our blood resembles bleach, which is also just as bad for us and can kill us. Which is why pH should be between 7.35 and 7.45. Now, there are two variables that affect pH levels. And I'm gonna go over both of those variables that can tell us exactly what's happening to the person and how do we fix this problem. Variable number one is the CO2 level. Now CO2 normal range is gonna be 35 to 45. What CO2 levels tell us is how well the person is breathing. I'm not gonna get into the exact mechanics of how well the person can breathe and how it's directly related. I will have that at a later video if you guys want to hear about that. So an easy way to see it is this. If you see anything higher than 45 on an ABG for CO2, that means the person is not breathing deep enough or fast enough. It's as simple as that. Anytime the number is higher than that, the person needs to take deeper breaths. Now, if the person is on a ventilator, that means you need to increase their tidal volume or increase their respiratory rate. On the other end of that, if the CO2 is less than 35, that means the patient is hyperventilating or breathing too fast or too deep and they need to slow it down, or if you're controlling their breathing, you need to slow their rate down or slow their amount of breath that you're giving them or what we call the tidal volume. Now let's just take a look at these two examples and see how they relate to each other. So let's take just CO2 without any of the other results and we see how it might affect pH. Roughly a CO2 of 60 will probably cause the pH to be around 7.25 to 7.35. If we see a CO2 of around 60, we could pretty much expect that the pH is gonna be somewhere below 7.35, and it's gonna be acidic and starting to uncoil or denature proteins. 
Higher number of CO2, they need to breathe more because they're not breathing deep enough. Lower number of CO2, they need to breathe less, they're breathing too fast or too deep. What's cool about how the CO2 is measured is that when you run it through an ABG machine, it actually measures it through an electrode called the severing house electrode. What's cool about this electrode is that it has a permeable membrane that the blood goes through and the CO2 levels directly change the pH scale of the actual electrode and that tells us exactly what, how much CO2 the blood has. The next number we're going to look at is going to be the oxygen level or the PaO2. Now, I didn't mention earlier, but PA stands for partial pressure. So the PaO2 value is around 80 to 100. What's cool about PaO2 and how it's measured is that once they get the blood and run it through the analysis machine, there is a cathode and, a, and an anode. And when you run the blood through them, they have a positive charge and oxygen has a negative charge. And what happens is it's directly proportional to the amount of oxygen that's in the blood and it's going to give off a positive charge and that's going to tell you exactly how much oxygen you do have in that blood sample. Now oxygen is pretty simple. If it's going to be anything below 80, typically you're going to want to put a nasal cannula on them and you're going to have to give them some form of oxygen. The highest theoretical amount of oxygen you can have on an ABG is going to be 663 now one cool thing about oxygen is that you can actually use the oxygen on your ABG if you divide it by how much oxygen you're giving the patient through their nose or through the vent and you can get a P to F equation which I'm going to leave down a link in the bottom to describe exactly what that means but it tells you what state of ARDS they're in. That's very relevant today with coronavirus because that's what we're looking at. The next number you're going to look at on an ABG is going to be the bicarb which is seen as HCO3. Bicarb tells us how the metabolism is working or how the metabolic system is working. A normal range for bicarb is going to be 22 to 26. Some textbooks might say 22 to 28, but in the mid 20s is what you want to look at. If the bicarb is going a little bit too high, what that's telling you is that the kidneys are trying to compensate for some kind of acidity that you have in your body. It's not always related to the CO2 levels, but sometimes it's directly proportional to the carbon dioxide level that you have in your body. Now, if your bicarb is getting any lower, that means you also have some kind of metabolic problem where your kidneys might be letting out too much bicarb or too much salts, and now you're getting into acidosis due to your bicarb levels. Now, those are pretty straightforward with what each number tells you and what happens. It starts getting a little bit more complicated when we start combining problems and we start getting mixed issues or compensating issues. Now, the body's pretty good at homeostasis. So what we might see is that if you have too much CO2 levels in your blood, what happens is your kidneys start holding on to bicarb and that goes up to balance out what's going on. It's trying to balance or compensate to make the pH still stabilized. An example of this, what you'll see will be in a COPD patient. A COPD patient will have a CO2 roughly around 50 to 60 now be their base. Because they have a problem with ventilation, they're not able to get all the CO2 levels out. Their blood is always a little bit more acidic, so they're going to have a higher bicarb level naturally. So with the COPD patient, you see that bicarb levels are actually helping counteract the acidity of the CO2 levels and the pH is going to be still pretty normal within that 7.35 to 7.45 range. You also see this in cases such as DKA. Now with DKA, which is diabetic ketoacidosis, you'll actually see somebody trying to hyperventilate themselves to try to compensate for the lack of bicarb they have. A normal ABG will look like this, 7.12, 20, 84, 13. So a typical blood gas will look like this, 7.15, 15, 98, 8. What these test results will tell you is that the bicarb level is so low that the respiratory system is trying to compensate so the person is hyperventilating and they still can't catch up, they still can't fix the problem. So they're gonna present to you as if they're in respiratory distress. So what you will do as a clinician is, if you see a high CO2 level, the next thing you wanna look at is, what is the pH of that individual ABG? Now if the pH is gonna be acidic, then the next thing you wanna look at is the bicarb level. And if the bicarb level is within normal limits, then that means that they're having a respiratory problem or what we call respiratory acidosis. If the bicarb was elevated a little bit, then that would be partially compensated or compensated respiratory acidosis, which means that 
the bicarb is actually compensating and fixing the pH level. In ABGs, compensated means that it's fixed the problem and the pH is normal. The whole point of ABGs is to see what the acidity level is and how we could fix the problem and what's going on. There are also other things ABGs can do. We could test for carboxyhemoglobin levels, which is the CO levels or carbon monoxide. Typically you wanna see the carboxyhemoglobin when you have CO poisoning or carbon monoxide poisoning. Somebody who's inhaled too many fumes is gonna present normal. Their SpO2 is actually gonna be reading 100%, but you wanna get an ABG that's gonna tell you what the CO level is. What you can also test for is met hemoglobin. That's if somebody is currently inhaling nitrous oxide for any kind of pulmonary hypertension problems. I didn't get into the anion gap or the base excess because those numbers don't actually help you as much when you're in the field. Base excess typically tells you where your base should be, which is the bicarb level. So if the base excess was negative nine, that means that you're probably gonna be a little bit higher normally for your bicarb levels. Now what we do see is that these are measured. The only calculated results are gonna be oxygen, CO2, and pH. Everything else is based on a calculation. So in the medical world, we don't spend too much time focusing on anything else. We focus on those four main results of an ABG. Now I'm gonna give you guys a few examples on how to interpret ABGs and what you might see. Now I'm gonna give you a few real world scenarios and you're gonna see exactly how their ABG would probably be presented. Now let's say you have a patient that's brought in code three through the ambulance, they're coming to the ED, they have an overdose of heroin. This patient's respiratory rate is about six, they've had way too much, they're about to get Narcan to reverse the effects of the heroin, and what's gonna happen is the doctor's gonna order an ABG, you're gonna get it, and this is what you're gonna see right here on the screen. Now, as you can see, the bicarb has not had enough time to compensate for what's going on, and this person is having respiratory acidosis. And respiratory acidosis can easily be fixed by giving this patient ventilations. So what you typically would do in a hospital setting is get a bag valve mask or a BVM and start breathing for them, or you put them on a BiPAP to give them a little bit more air into their lungs and help them ventilate better. Another example you might see is you get called to an RRT. You walk into the room, the patient's breathing 35 breaths a minute, which is every one to two seconds they're taking a breath. They look like they're in respiratory distress. The doctor wants to order a BiPAP or some kind of ventilation device. What you get is you request an ABG. If the doctor has not already ordered one, you get the ABG and what you see is this. What this tells you is that they're actually having a metabolic acidosis issue and their respiratory system is trying really hard to compensate. So we would call this partially compensated metabolic acidosis. This is not a respiratory issue. They need to fix their kidneys or they need to fix something in their me metabolic system. I'll give one more example. Now let's say you find a patient that's been down for about 10 minutes. So you start bagging the patient, you start breathing for the patient with the BVM mask. After about 20 minutes, the doctor says, let's get an ABG. And you get an ABG and the results look like this. So what happens? You start breathing a little bit faster, you start breathing a little bit harder because you see that the CO2 levels are a little bit high. There is nobody that can help with intubation, so you're just stuck bagging the patient. 30 more minutes have passed by now, you've been giving bigger breaths, you've also been breathing a little bit more frequently for them. And another RT gets an ABG while you're breathing for them still, and then the test results will look like this. As you can see, the breathing helped blow off a lot of that CO2, which brought the pH way up. Now, this is exactly what we expect in the medical field. This is what you're gonna see. After watching this video, I hope you get a little bit better understanding of how ABGs work. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask me. I'd love to answer any of your questions. Please subscribe to my channel. Like this video if you did enjoy this content. I'll see you guys again next time.